afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. This program called the Amrit Kal Vimarsh. May I request uh, the director, Rangan Banerjee, to say a few words and welcome the audience. It's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Chidambaram. Dr. Chidambaram is actually one of us. He has, till some time back, he was the chairman of our board of governors. And um, he has, of course, to anyone in India, Dr. Chidambaram really needs no introduction. You know, after a very successful leading role in our nuclear program. He also was an administrator and he was the principal scientific advisor to the government of India. And during that time, many new initiatives uh, have been launched. He has been the chairman of, at least I know, IIT Delhi, IIT Bombay, IIT Madras, IIT Jodhpur, and maybe many more for several times. Uh, we have been fortunate to have the benefit of his experience. And the amazing thing is that despite all his experience, he, he is so much down to earth and so willing to spend time and give advice. So we, he will give a talk, but he will also interact with you. So please feel free to ask him anything. And he's, uh, he, he has, a very interesting perspective on things. And um, so he, uh, Dr. Chidambaram, I remember as PSA when you started an initiative called the RUTAG, and where you know you were talking of technology in the rural areas and how that can make a difference. And he also created many new concepts. We talked of basic research and applied research, and he talked about directed basic research. And Dr. Chidambaram always looked at, looks at the evidence and suggests that looking at the evidence and seeing. So we thought that he's the right person to talk to us about India's science and technology journey and the future. And we are delighted that when we asked him, he was happy to accept. Uh, so you would like to formally introduce? Yes. So I, I'm, I'm uh, delighted that he's here with us and I look forward to his talk and the interaction with, I think, he especially enjoys interacting with young people. And uh, the, he's probably the youngest one in mind from all of us, and he keeps telling, <laughs> he says that, you know, us young people. So uh, I think we are delighted to have you here, sir. Thank you. So I'll now. Despite the director saying that he needs no introduction, I'll formally introduce Dr. Raju Gopal Chidambaram. And I will stay away from all the administrative things here that he has done in the past. He is now the DAE Homi Bhabha Professor at BARC. He was born on 12th November 1936, in case he is forgotten, uh, at Madras. And he obtained his BSc degree in physics in 1956, securing first rank. And as he likes to say, he didn't go to NIIT and didn't crack the JE. And then he pauses and he says, because there was no JE at that time. He followed it up with an MSc in physics by research, if I am not mistaken, and his BSc was at Presidency College, Madras. His B MSc in Physics was by research, I understand, at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, but awarded by the University of Madras for research done on the design of an analog computer for Fourier summation in crystallography. He obtained his PhD in 1962 for research work done on nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy done under the supervision of G. Suryan. Professor Suryan, for those of you who are not NMR spectroscopists, and that's probably just two of us here, um, 
who are just NMR spectroscopists, is one of those unsung um, scientists in NMR spectroscopy. He didn't get the uh, recognition that he deserved. He did a lot of novel things which people didn't recognize. His PhD thesis was awarded the Martin Foster Medal for the best thesis in 1961-62. Uh, right from when he was a PhD student, he was supported by DAE. He was, I think, a fellow J JRF DAE support, and he continued after that in DAE and stayed there ever after. He has made significant contributions in at least four areas of condensed matter physics, nuclear magnetic resonance, which is where he started, Newton diffraction, X-ray diffraction, and hydrogen bonding. For those chemists who are here, he had some papers, very initial papers on OHO, bent hydrogen bonds, and on high pressure and shock wave physics and quasicrystals. I will now read out something that he said, delivering the 26th Homi Bhabha lecture of IETE in 1995. And he said, considering our natural resources and the state of development of other related technologies, thermal power based on coal and nuclear power can together meet our future demand of electricity. The Indian nuclear program today is in a position to play a prominent role towards this, this national objective of power generation. For India, nuclear power will be an inevitable option to satisfy our future energy needs. The world has moved along a lot in three decades since Dr. Jaydambaram gave this Homi Bhabha lecture, made these observations there. Now it's possible that he'll touch upon some of that in today's lecture, the title of which is up on the screen. Dr. Chidambaram. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind, uh, kind introduction. It's always a pleasure for me to come to IIT Delhi, even visiting, even though I may not, not have any specific responsibility. It was a pleasure to visit any IIT, because IITs have such a high brand, uh, brand equity. And as you were mentioning, I couldn't get into the IITs. You think I failed in the exam? Because when I started my undergraduate education, there were no IITs. So I joined, finished in Presidency College, then joined the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, which is also a wonderful place, wonderful place to do research. And after my PhD there, MSc also I did there, PhD. then I joined Bach. And as you mentioned, I've been there ever after, <laughs> one way or another. Even when they offered me the post of the principal scientific advisor, I had a meeting with Prime Minister Vajpayee. I told him I can spend only half the time in Delhi. If I spend full time in Delhi, whatever knowledge I have will dissipate. Because it's not like spending in IIT Delhi, sitting in my office in Delhi. So only half the time I can spend here and half the time in Bach. So that I said I charge myself in BRC and discharge myself in Delhi. So Bajpayeeji said you do whatever you like. <laughs> the wonderful, wonderful person of course as a great human being apart from being a great prime minister. This is Amrit Kal. And so I thought I'll talk on achievements in Indian science and technology. Because the young people should know there are a lot of things that we have done over the years, and from Raman effect to nuclear power. Most of all, 
what we want, particularly the young people, is not just India to become a developed country. That, of course, we want, where the quality of life is high. But also we want India to become a knowledge economy. If you want to sustain development, you have to become a knowledge economy with the ability to generate new knowledge and with the ability to appropriate knowledge generated anywhere in the world and derive value from that. And for doing this, we must have a STI ecosystem seeks excellence in basic research, applied research, technology development, R&D-led innovation, backed by high-quality manufacturing skills. And this would lead to a knowledge-driven economy with the ability to develop new knowledge and, as I said, ability to appropriate whatever knowledge you want from anywhere in the world. So we want an advanced technology superstructure, but we also want to have a very strong foundation for that. And that foundation is provided by basic research. Sometimes people think you go on developing technology. Don't worry about basic research. You can't make a worse mistake than that. If you are not strong in basic research, see, even a place in big technology projects like Manhattan Project. They have a pro they had a problem because if you plutonium is used in nuclear weapons and you take molten plutonium and you try to solidify it, it becomes porous. And all the great engineers of the Manhattan Project tried all kinds of methods. They couldn't get a proper casting. Then they went and asked Cyril Stanley Smith, Basic research, metallurgist, basic research. He said, what do we do about it? Plutonium is not uh, coming into a form which can be used in nuclear weapons. And he had not studied plutonium, but he said, add 3% gallium, it will never go to the alpha phase. It will, from the delta phase, at which it solidifies, if it goes to uh, any metal, for that matter, mold, you go to a 15 gram per cc to 19 gram per cc, the material has to become porous. So he said it will remain in the delta phase, and that's how the weapon was made. And all of us use that. And even in my experience, I've been, when you do high technology, you come into some problem which, which, which you have never encountered before. And to develop high technology, you must be either surrounded by, in your own organization, or you must have access to scientists, basic research scientists, who can help you if and when a problem arises. See, India, India celebrates four days in science and technology. Science Day, February 28th. The day that the discovery of the Raman effect after him was announced by C.V. Raman, whom I consider the greatest experimental physicist India has produced. Mathematics Day, the birthday of Srinivas Ramanujam, who has been called the magical genius. Engineers Day, the birthday of Mokshagundam Mishweswaraya, the greatest engineer. He was a civil engineer India has produced. And then technology, May 11, the first day of the 1998 Pokhran test. Afterwards, the government declared 11th May as the technology day. Raman, you see, Raman was alive when I was a PhD student, and I've often gone there. He had a very strange habit. You give a lecture when Raman was sitting, at the end of it, he will say, whenever you talk about some new original idea, he will say, that was in the back of my mind, whatever original idea you say. That idea was in the back of my mind. See, when he got the Nobel Award, of course, he says, I saw it as a personal triumph. Then he looked up, and uh, he saw he was sitting in, under the Union Jack flag, 
And Raman was a very tough guy. But he says he broke down. Then he realized his poor country did not even have a flag of its flag of its own. Today, how many years after independence? Young people have huge opportunities. You can't say I don't have opportunities, I am not a I'm not independent country, there are no excuses. And India wants you to deliver whatever field you take up. Always try to excel. Maybe I'll say it again. Vivekananda once said, Swami Vivekananda, the old theology was you are an atheist if you don't believe in God. New theology, hundred years back. The new theology is you are an atheist, you don't believe in yourself. Self-belief. All of you, have self-belief. Don't get beset by doubt. Yeah, hey, yeah, kya ho jayega, ye ho gaya, to ye fail ho gaya. Because if it can really happen, you have the capability to fix it. Self-belief in yourself and also in your country, in your institution before that, step by step. There is nothing I cannot do. There is nothing my institution cannot do. There is nothing India cannot do. Is the sequence. See, Chandrasekhar was a nephew of C.V. Raman, by the way, as many of you would know. Very great astrophysicist, also a Nobel laureate. Kameshwar Wali has written a biography of uh, Chandrasekhar. And he was asked by Wali, how did India produce world class scientists like C.V. Raman, S.N. Bose, so many others? See, in those days, in the 1920s, Raman says, there was need for self-expression as a part of the national movement. To show the West we were equal to them in this field, which they thought was their own. And Sommerfeld, the great Sommerfeld, quantum people who know quantum mechanics know about Sommerfeld. India had suddenly emerged in competitive research as an equal partner with our European and American sisters, after the work done by Raman, with very limited uh, equipment. Raman effect was discovered with just, uh, you'd be amazed if you count, put it in dollars, how many dollars that equipment cost. The idea was more important than the equipment. See, Arthur Kostler, I don't know how many of you have read Arthur Kostler, Art of Living, for instance. He talks of two kinds of leaders, the yogi and the kamisa. Yogi is the contemplative thinker. Kamisa is the man of action. Most leaders are, of course, a mix of the two, but one, one quality dominates. But Homi Bhabha appeared to be though mathematically absurd. 100% eh? yogi, 100% kamisa. Theoretical physicist who came back from abroad, he thought of building indigenous nuclear reactors in India at a time when we were not even making bicycles of indigenous design. What kind of self-belief uh, person like that? must have. So Swami Vivekananda, Homi Bhabha, both of them are saying the same thing. And it's true for all you and guys, self-belief. Of course, Bhabha was the president of the first Geneva Conference and the peaceful user, founder member of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Pat one was chairman of the, the Board of Governors of uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency. There is a boardroom, it's a small round table where all the members of the board sit. And outside, one end, there was a bust of Eisenhower. Uh, beyond another door was a bust of Kurchatov. Another door, Otto Hahn, the great man who discovered fission. One door was vacant. 
So as chairman of the board, I suggested, why not we put the bust of Baba here? And they agreed. They all unanimously agreed that Baba had contributed so much, not only to India, but to the development. You know, all international agencies are in Geneva, but IAEA is in Vienna. And the reason was Baba brought it because he was interested in opera music. There is more opera music in Vienna than in Geneva. And when he said, they all agreed, and it came to... See, look at the great people we have produced, Satyendranath Bose. See, there are two kinds of fundamental particles. Spin half, you call it fermion, after great Enrico Fermi. If it is spin zero or integral, you call it boson, after Satyendranath Bose. So look at the level, internationally how photon is a boson, by the way. And then, of course, there's a, some years back, there was a big uh, problem about how discovering the Higgs boson in the Large Hadron Collider in, in, in Geneva. You know, colliders, what they do? Two particles collide, <coughs> energy disappears. You have all heard of Einstein equation, E is equal to mc squared. When fission of an uranium nucleus takes place, the mass, added mass of the resultant particles is less than the mass of the uranium-235 plus that one neutron. That difference you multiply by c squared. That's how you get nuclear energy or fusion energy also, same way isotopes of hydrogen, when they fuse, there is a energy, energy de deficit over there. That's where the... And in that standard, when they were in a model, they were doing... The, there was only one particle which was missing, which was called the Higgs boson. And boson is Satyendranath Bose. I mentioned about Srinivas Ramanujam. There is a wonderful book. I'm sure it's there in your library. Mathematicians here would know about the man who knew infinity. And fascinating book. I've read it. Very review. There is more than one book. And uh, you know, you talk about robots now, super intelligent robots, artificial intelligence has grown so much, they say, AI, come back to this later, AI, and they think using artificial intelligence you can create robots smarter than any human, but that uh, I don't believe and I'll tell you why I don't believe, but in any case, the super intelligent robots, this is what he says, you can talk about them, but he said, no enhancement of human intelligence through this kind of machine learning opens a door to becoming a Ramanujam, and no algorithm is likely to produce robots with the abilities of a Ramanujam. It's by the Hebrew University of Israel. Let us go to the other side now. We are doing and talking about mathematics. We are all worried about what's happening to the world, climate change. And uh, already they wanted to stop the uh, global warming, average global warming. Of course, temperature differences there have been in the tropics and, the, and Siberia, for instance. But the average global temperature should not go about 1.5 degrees. Already it had risen by 1 degree. Because if it rises, glaciers will melt, sea level will go up, low-lying islands will get inundated. So this is the international panel on climate change has been warning that we must cut down carbon dioxide emissions. Carbon dioxide emitted by burning fossil fuels goes and settles upstairs, doesn't allow the infrared radiation to go out, get 
gets it reflected back onto the that causes causes global warming and uh, they said we should not allow it to go about 1.5 degrees that doesn't look possible at all now because the global people have not been as disciplined countries so most of the damage has been done by the already developed countries they are the ones who have evicted carbon dioxide but we are all suffering we can't say you did it i'll also until i catch up with you i will also do it but then it is going to hurt the globe and we are also affected and particularly the countries near the equator are more affected than those in the northern or southern uh, southern hemisphere and now 1.5 degrees seems impossible and uh, of course they are saying that with no credible pathway and uh, so we have to at least not allow it to go beyond 2 degrees of course there have been very famous indian scientists many of them you have heard about who have indians of educated in india but they went abroad and contributed their chandrashekhar nobel prize chandrashekhar limit on the mass of any white dwarf that exceeds this mass is destined to end its life in the most violent of explosion supernova this is comes out it's called the chandrashekhar limit then there was a famous biochemist i don't think most of you would have heard about this illa pragada subara who discovered the function of adenosine triphosphate as an energy source in the cell ergon corona is much more recent one can ge- uncovering the genetic uh, code not only that but for chemical synthesis of the first gene a biological molecule which one of the this determines your genetic uh, characteristics and then venki ramakrishna who solved the structure of the ribosome which at that time was the biggest molecule whose structure has been solved by x-ray x-ray crystallography coming to nuclear energy of course india is one of the top five six countries in the world in nuclear energy even 10 years back the director general of iaea had said that india is at the forefront of technological development in the nuclear sector see most countries have gone for thermal reactors we have also gone for thermal reactors the light water reactors heavy water reactors but then uranium if you take only less than 1% of uranium is uranium 235 which undergoes fission in a reactor 99 plus percent is uranium 238 if you put it into a reactor it picks up a neutron becomes uranium 239 emits two beta rays which are electrons when they come out of the nucleus atomic number goes up so what was uranium 238 becomes plutonium 239 and pluto plutonium 239 is a very good fissile material which can be used in a reactor this is what we call closing the nuclear fuel cycle that is take the plutonium out of thermal reactors and putting back so i in hyderabad i was saying this closing the nuclear fuel cycle so that the lifetime of the uranium goes up by 50 times next day indian express had that headline chidambaram wants to close the nuclear program <laughs> close the ye ye mere kab ka fortunately you know in newspapers you must remember the text is written by the reporter text was all right but the headline is done by the editor text was correct but the editor didn't understand what the reporter had said so so i had to give a lot of answers here why when why do you want to close down the anyway if you are able then you see we have the world's one of the world's uh, largest reserves of thorium thorium if we put into a fast reactor 
picks up a neutron, again emits two beta rays, and becomes uranium-233, which is a good fission fuel. So that is the ultimate thorium-uranium-233 cycle, third stage of our nuclear program. If we are able to do that, the same quantity of uranium will give you 600 times more power. Because if we use only uranium, as many countries are trying to do, and throw away the spent fuel as waste, uranium nuclear power won't last very long. But if you close the nuclear fuel cycle, of course it will require development of uh, new, new technologies. Safety and reliability go together, you know. Whether it's your personal car or a nuclear reactor, car. If the brakes work well, the clutch doesn't give you trouble, most probably you'll never get into an accident. Of course, you must have a good driver. Same way, if the reactor is, has a very good design and has good operators, and you see that this unit one of the Kaiga pressurized heavy water reactor, even in 2018, broke the record for continuous operation without even a maintenance shutdown, 941 days. Of course, since then many more records have been broken. And also we take care of the greenery. For every tree we cut to build a nuclear reactor, we build, we plant 10 trees of the same genre. And that's why if you see around any reactor you'll find this is Kaiga, one, two, three, four. You see the four towers there. See, there is a term called anti-fragile. I don't know how many of you have heard this word by this famous author, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. He's famous for introducing the phrase, the black swan. The black swan is an unexpected event with serious consequences. But he also introduced the word anti-fragile. Fragile are things which break down under stress. Robust are things which withstand stress. Anti-fragile are things which get stronger under stress. Like some of these antibiotic resistant bacteria. And I've always said, Indian nuclear program is anti-fragile. The more they try to pressurize us, the more self-reliant they become, we became. And the more self-reliant we become and we are strong, they want to come back to us for collaboration. This is true for any technology. First they will make sure, using things like IPR, intellectual property rights, technology control regimes like missile and other things. But if you have finished all that and go ahead, they want to collaborate. They know they can also learn from us. So, when I was director of Bach this long time back, I had said, self-reliance is immunity against technology denial. And that denial does not take place. And also, we should learn to live. Nothing wrong with international collaboration. I've said somewhere else also. But today's India should collaborate only as an equal partner. And we must collaborate to strengthen our own initiatives. And of course, advanced technologies today are multidisciplinary. And this is where an institution like IIT can play a very big part. I'm sure you are specializing in one subject, but in principle, you can always go and elect. Have got, if you've got time, go and attend. Nobody prevents you, no, from going and attending a lecture on a subject which is not part of your course, part of your degree course, but something that interests you. That's a great advantage of uh, the IITs. Don't find that in... Most universities, of course, there are some. Emerging technologies. Many emerging technologies which can be disruptive. 
And if you have to use them, you have to analyze them using what is called technology foresight. Technology foresight has to be distinguished from technology forecasting. Any technology, upcoming technology, emerging technology, you can use technology foresight to predict how far is this likely to develop. But if you take into account your own requirements, your own assessment of your own resources, and then decide this technology is good for India, then it becomes technology foresight. Technology forecasting plus national assessment is equal to technology foresight. And if you do that, then you find that all these are important, energy technology, electronic system, network technology, nuclear, space, transportation, AI, machine learning, rural development, and so on. And of course, this list may differ from person to person. There is no unanimity in the judgment on this, though there is unanimity in many of these, for example, energy, nuclear, space, AI, and all that. It's very interesting statement by Henry Petrovsky. Science is about knowing. Engineering is about doing. And in IIT they teach you to do both. Know it and then you do it. Both are important. And then coming to national security, in the 10th Naidama lecture, which is how many? 25 years back. I had said that national development and national security are two sides of the same coin. Development without security is vulnerable. Security without development is meaningless. If you see countries, history, historically, countries which are highly developed, but not secure, were afraid of tiny countries in their neighborhood. Don't want to mention names. And there are big countries which are very strong in security, but then they had ignored development. But now, Parstroika, they had to go for development. Now I've told you which country it is. This is very important that uh, the greatest advantage of recognized strength is that you don't have to use it. It's true for a person, it is true for a country. And the greatest disadvantage of perceived e weakness is that your enemy may get adventurous. That's why I tell the girls in the audience learn self-defense. If some unpleasant character knows, can give him a karate chop at a sensitive point, he will keep a distance from you. First you know it, and then you let it be known that I know it. I'm saying karate chopping. Of course, the Pokhran tests were a very big team effort mostly within Bach, but the chemical explosives and all, making those explosives, we had the help of one of the DRDO labs, uh, TBRL, then we conducted a perfect nuclear weapon design, because we had everything. Each one of these areas, it's not one day, one, one technology or one science, nuclear weapon, it was many technologies. And in each one of these areas, we have some of the world's leading experts. Now, anyway, I knew we have, we'll get only one chance to do the test, 98. So in one stroke, we did all the tests, five tests. The, th the advanced fission device, the thermonuclear device, and what I call the three chotus, less than one kiloton, sub-kiloton devices in order to prove some principles that we wanted to prove. Of course, now we can do anything, and we are doing it also. Designed from low yield to up to about 200 kiloton. 
There is no target which deserves about 200 kiloton. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, 12 kiloton, 15 kiloton. They knocked out one kilometer radius. And the range of destruction goes as the cube root of the device. Two kilometers multiply by eight. 100 to 120 kilotons. And there is no value if you put it in the middle of a metropolitan center. I don't want to do it. I'm just saying, academically, <laughs> beyond two kilometers there is nothing. Nobody should use nuclear weapons. I'm all for nuclear disarmament. But we must have nuclear deterrence. Nuclear deterrence means nobody should threaten us with the use of nuclear weapons against us if you don't do something. That we have achieved. So forget about it and do a development thing. So that part is done. This is a cartoon which precedes the 1998 test, before we tested. And this guy who is suited, booted, ugly, Obviously, Western guy telling the Gandhi cap, you must not make the bomb. Why do you want the bomb? And the Gandhi cap tells him, because if I had one, you wouldn't talk to me like this. Of course, this immediately after our test, Payne and Mackenzie showed this Venn diagram. You know, all know what's a Venn diagram. Any particular property you take, Intersecting circles means that property is shared between. Look at it. UK was part of US as far as the Manhattan project was concerned. From US, the knowledge went to France. France to Israel, Israel to South Africa. Russia to China, China to Pakistan. And look where my India is alone. They agree. That no knowledge was given to us either through friendship or through stealing. We acquired it by stealing. Of course, we must go for international uh, collaboration, both in basic science and in high technology. This is what we have done. The uh, San Geneva Large Hadron Collider, I briefly mentioned before, when they looked for the Higgs, uh, Higgs boson, the missing particle in the standard model of the nuclear. And then in the ETA, this international thermonuclear experimental reactor and coming up in France, no one country can afford to build it. So all of them are collaborating and we have supplied them the cryostat in which the tokamak, in which the particles are moving is held. This is the largest tokamak some years back, 2020 has been installed in ETA, made by LNT, Hazira, 30 meters in height and 30 meters in diameter. Huge cryostatus. Wonderful to see. This, this is the one which uh, largest uh, vessel of its kind in the world. And then, of course, we have to go for centers for uh, electronics, Nanoelectronics. At one time it was, uh, we, I wanted it because nothing was happening at that time, 2005. And we had, uh, I remember a meeting I was attending and the uh, Minister for Electronics was there. And I told, uh, I was said in my keynote speech, we missed the microelectronics revolution. You shouldn't miss the nano electronic, Arun Shauri. After the meeting was over, when he went sit down, you are the principal scientific advisor, what are you doing about it? So I said, I'll meet you afterwards. <laughs> and I said, give me 150 crores. I'll set up two world class centers. And then we had a brainstorming. It was decided the best locations at that time could be Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And IIT Bombay. Now, of course, they are in all IIT's big uh, nanoelectronic centers. And then, of course, this Indian uh, National Knowledge Network, which also was a 
brought up by the PSC's office when I was there, connecting. There are now 1,750 plus knowledge institutions which are connected by the National Knowledge Network. And it's a wide band. And uh, for if you are doing big data science, sharing knowledge, you can even joint experiments you can do by using this. And you know, it's very interesting. I don't know how many of you have read, uh, you all know a Harari, Harari, Homodius. He says, human nowadays completely dominate the planet not because the individual human is far smarter and more nimble-fingered than the individual chimp or wolf, but because Homo sapiens is the only species on earth capable of cooperating flexibly in large numbers. And that comes from language. And then communication is the foundation. You talk to each other, language is how it started. Now you have electronic communication and you have this wide bandwidth national knowledge network. And I'm sure IIT is one of the major, one of the top users of this. Then you must have supercomputers, go for cyber security. And we have this SETS organization in uh, Chennai, was set up by the PSA's office. And finally, we must expert in technology management. And uh, it requires innovation support, leadership. You have a technology roadmap. And then, as we say, as I explained before, we need uh, technology foresight to decide what are the critical technologies for India at any point of time. And varies from country to country. And uh, and then you can you can decide on that. The such development delivery this is the root. The case of industrial development, it's the development segment which is weak. The such institutions are strong. Delivery industry, industrial institutions, industry companies are strong. Development, that interface is the one which we talk about academia, industry, interaction. But in the case of uh, rural, it is the delivery which is weak. Knowledge is there, not able to go there. And that delivery can be done only by proximate institutions we have. That's why I created this RUTAG. IT Delhi is a major player in this RUTAG. And then, of course, scaling of innovations through knowledge transfer, knowledge brokering, as it is called. That is knowledge available in one place, you use it in another place. Same knowledge, same kind of, it's called knowledge brokering. And, uh, of course, for a poor man, if you are able to increase rural technology, the double is income. Double is income. See, you double my income, only my bank balance will go up. Or for that matter, Dr. Rangan Banerjee's income, only your bank balance. Your quality of life will not change at all. But if you are near the poverty line, see, suppose you earn 100 rupees a month, 90 rupees goes on survival, 10 rupees determines the quality of your life. But if I double it, 200, the quality of life goes up by an order of magnitude. That's why I've, I started this theorem that for a person near the poverty line, his or her quality of income is a very non-linear function of his income. Poverty line. And finally, this is the uh, Rutag, which is, I hope, I have left the office some time back. I'm sure it's going very well. Delhi is a major, major player, and a meeting on this was organized in 2018. This, for example, you take simple things, which we did under the Ruta. We went to Uttarakhand, I saw ravines like this. 
not very big ravines and uh, there in those villages in uttarakhand the land is on one side they live on the other side of the ravine so i have seen this poor women carrying head loads going down and then coming up and the least that happen to them happens to them is they sprain their ankle so i said this is ridiculous and i went to drdo drdo when they go advance into enemy territory they out there uh, jawans can quickly build roads or bridges for the enemy for the troops to cross over i asked them can they do it here but don't use very lithium aluminum alloy and all that because their jawan is carrying on his back you can use steel so this has made a lot of difference then now there 10 years back bridges like this were built across ravines in uttarakhand ko they started in this village called baghi which i have shown here i called it the women's bridge because the women are very happy because all that problem of going down and coming up was gone installed over asan ganga finally technology is power this is a phrase i paraphrase of alvin toffler what he said was yesterday violence was power whoever had the best technology for inflicting violence was the most powerful even today today wealth is power whoever has the money to buy technology and develop technology was the more powerful of course tomorrow knowledge will be power that is the ultimate when normal easy technologies have all been developed the person who can develop the latest technology on all you young guys your institute has technology in its name what country wants it for you to develop the latest uh, technology the time for catching up the catching up game time is over you must lead have developed technologies not developed anywhere in the world and of course you have to prevent them bab 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 anyway the uh, <laughs> i mentioned about swami vivekananda he is a atheist who does not believe in himself and our leaders must have an appetite for risk taking there are some people who are addicted to saying i'll go only for proven technology and i tell them proven technologies are obsolete technologies the more you prove them the more obsolete they become and we must develop immunity against technology denial in high technology areas and this is already happening in sensitive areas and then seek international collaboration on an equal partner basis coming back to india for dreams young guys like you india which is economically developed scientifically advanced and with a knowledge economy and militarily strong and we must be present in the frontiers of science and technology for that as i mentioned briefly we need synergy we need collaboration but we need synergy among the concerned parties in every cooperative interaction interactive scientific effort and we need coherence among all the efforts and we need a technology superstructure and a foundation which is provided by institutions like yours the manpower the capabilities higher education and basic uh, research i think i'll stop here maybe and be happy to try to answer any questions you have
I'll sit here, stand here. He's here. Namaskar. Mic. Do I need a mic? I don't know. Will I need a mic? Okay. Okay, please. I am an alumnus of uh, DMS, Department, Department of Management Studies. Passed out MBA in 2012. Now I am retired. Last month only I retired and having spent 39 years in BHL and last eight I, months... I am sorry, Professor. I need you in front here. I am not a professor, sir. I am not a professor. Please, let me, let me come there. Let me come there. Because there is an echo, echo which is coming. You are speaking okay. clearly and... In fact, I can, I can speak without uh, mic also. This is what I Okay. Think. If you come here, okay. you can I'll leave the that. mic. Okay, I'll do that. I'll just keep it here. I'll just take two minutes, not more than that. And then I'll leave it to Dr. Vidamram to really come in from that. I'm Shakti Kumar Balotia. I'm a partner from DMS in Kuala Lumpur. Having spent 29 years in education, I was at the Institute of Education. I go to school, and I did that introduction. And then last eight months, I was there at HEC as director of production. I only retired last month on 24 December. I talk about education. You are the person who I suppose initiated that project. It is advanced and just for fiction for Karma Power Station. The technology was developed with the, like the government of India for IT card, DHL and NDPC. Having spent all its growth on that, the design was really validated by the foreigners also, but it is not able to see the commercialization. So we, because even if we talk about 2017, this AUSC technology will be flat and it was your foresight and your forecasting, whatever the good terms we are giving it, but nobody is there to take it further so that that, that can see like others do. I will leave it there for this. Thank you very much. <laughs> see, Professor, you can even take a donkey to the water, but you can't make it drink. But is this can, can any help? See, the anything? person, people who are running, thermal power plant. Of course, it's advanced technology. Because there is always a risk when you take up a new technology. And the power demand in India is so high that there is a, there is a pressure for them. No, I'm, I, I can come here. The, the demand on power is so high because per capita electricity consumption, as I've shown, is directly related to the Human Development uh, Index. So, instead of spending time on developing new technologies, existing technologies, they say, okay, if I can do 400, 500, even 700, why bother another few hundred? But it was a very nice, in my opinion, efficient technology, particularly in the... Con the more if you power... The higher the temperature you get from a fuel, from a burning coal, the more efficient is the any kind of cycle, Carnot cycle or any kind of fuel cycle that you can think of. And to that extent it is going to it would have cut down the consumption of uh, carbon and to that extent it would have cut down carbon dioxide emission. But then the people who own or run power plants have to decide. Technology has been developed, available. Maybe one or two were built. I'm not, I'm out of touch, honest. I mean, has been built, no, no, something, they some... They were to come up with the project at Deepa. It was all decided, but finally... It was no, not Deepa, but something has been done. But I am out of the PSA's of side. I'm not so keeping I track. Okay, okay. I think you may, you may have the later information. Yes. Can you come down? Uh, thank you, sir, for your talk. Sir, my question is, how, do, how does international politics and changing international diplomatic relations affect uh, nuclear programs of countries like India? See, this is, uh, 
you can collaborate scientifically only with countries who are friendly to you. There is nothing much you can do about it. Certainly a country which is not friendly to you is no country is going to give you any advanced knowledge or advanced technology. But there are enough around. And India is by itself is very, very powerful. There's a lot of collaboration which can go out within within institutions in India. Because there's so much uh, knowledge already available complementary knowledge so that one could uh, make use of it. But this is true everywhere. During the Cold War, Russia will not give technology to America and vice versa. That's I Thank you, sir. The more, but the stronger you become, the more people will come to us. Um, hello, sir. Thank you for your talk. I wanted to ask that, like, for example, in the coal industry, the smoke, uh, it was like dangerous for the environment, harmful. So even there's uh, nuclear power uh, plants and we are using radioactive materials like uranium, plutonium. So even disposing these uh, radioactive materials, like, it takes a lot because uh, uh, they are still harmful, even if they have lost almost... Uh, all of their uh, radioactivity, and they don't like lo uh, lose everything. So even disposing them, uh, uh, isn't it like uh, harmful? Still harmful to the environment. So how uh, like we can say that nuclear power plant is uh, beneficial, uh, or nuclear power is beneficial for us, e even when, uh, when we are creating something, a waste that is still harmful. See, once uh, fuel has burnt in a reactor, the spent fuel has to be reprocessed, is reprocessed, to take out whatever is valuable inside it and then make it, remaining is waste, what we call nuclear waste. You can do it for any process in the nuclear fuel cycle. The best way is to dispose of nuclear waste is to vitrify it, put it into glass, so that even if water comes into contact with it, no radioactivity is reached out. And then you have to dispose it in an underground uh, place where there is uh, no water likely to come in contact with it. But on the other hand, you also look at the fly ash in coal. And the quantities we are now talking about are thousands of times more than the quantity of nuclear waste that we are talking about. Of course, they are disposed of in the used up uh, coal mines, and it is necessary, as you know, no question of that. So we have to learn, waste will be produced, and it has to be disposed of. Even you cook food, waste is produced. Kitchen waste, methods of disposing it out safely. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Take all value out of it before disposing. That's what India does. Once through plutonium, uh, the uranium reactor, some people dispose of including the plutonium as a waste. <coughs> Valuable material. You to, we take out the plutonium. The major radioactive part is taken out and used, and only the remaining is uh, disposed. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, may you please, please explain uh, when you said that proven technologies are obsolete? Uh, I mean that if we want to go, let's say if we want to go into renewables, so if we want to have large scale deployment, so we need to use proven technologies only. How can we uh, build large scale things using new technologies? It would be very risky. Large scale what? Large scale, like let's say solar plants. Huh? Let's say if we want to... I'm not able to hear properly. Can you come over here? 
let's say if we want to develop start from the beginning uh, i with, with the mic near him out young man come on now uh, i want to ask that if you said that proven technologies are obsolete uh, want to know more on this that if we want to let's say deploy some technologies on large scale let's say solar plant or something <laughs> so we cannot do it y- using new research don't take things. it to say that was a joke <laughs> sometimes you must allow me to cut a joke you must okay. use proven technologies but the idea was you must also develop uh, new technologies which are much better than that proven technologies can never be thought of as end of the road you must make them better in efficiency in terms of waste production in terms of ease of use and so on but you cannot throw a proven technology <laughs> okay normal breathing is proven technology <laughs> okay i guess if there are no further questions Yeah. Yeah, I think. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um I think we have the next tea. Uh, there is tea outside, of course. Um when is the next institute lecture? 25th of September we'll have the institute lecture by uh, Professor Deepthi Ranjan Sahu, the new um Bhatnagar awardee of the institute. Uh, guys, we have refreshments.